Washington Grown is brought to you by the Washington State Department of Agriculture's Specialty Crop Block Grant Program and Northwest Farm Credit Services, supporting agriculture and rural communities with reliable, consistent credit and financial services today and tomorrow. Hi, I'm Christy Gorenson and welcome to Washington Grown. Flowers are a great way to say thank you, I love you, but what about bon appetit? In this episode, we're gonna learn all about growing, enjoying, and even cooking with flowers. We'll start in the kitchen at the Seattle restaurant Marmite, making two different dishes using edible flowers. It's a party in my mouth. Tomas will be in a lavender lover's paradise at Trinity Lavender Farms. And there's there my first bunch of lavender. Well Check done. That out. And I'll visit the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market. A lot of flowers in here people don't realize are edible. Yeah. All this and much more today on Washington Grown. We grow them big in Washington. You're like, I can put her to work. Right now. Oh yeah. <laughs> no. Are you getting tired already? No. I <laughs> Am I doing this right? It's like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. This is one of the hardest things I've ever done on this show. Cheers, thanks for having us. Unique, elegant, charming. These are just a few words that describe the French-inspired restaurant Marmite. It's really delicious, it's local, and it's fresh, and I would recommend it to anyone. The food is really good, the, the ambiance is, is comfortable. I lived in Paris for three years, and. So this delicious. takes me right back. Very intimate, quaint, but also very sophisticated. French techniques, local ingredients, wonderful flavors, but in a less formal setting. Owner and chef Bruce Naftali draws his inspiration from his love of sauces and French cuisine. He uses the traditional methods of French cooking, but has his own inventive and creative flair. Chef Naftali also embraces the farm-to-table lifestyle by using as much locally grown food as possible. There are other people all around who put their love and time and energy into growing things the way that we do into cooking them. And Seattleites can taste the local passion and love in the food. He really pays attention to the flavors and foods. You know, he brings basic things that are comfort foods in some way, but he has his own touch. One unique touch that Chef Naftali has is using flowers in his cooking. There are many flowers that are edible, but I like to discover the ones that actually have a lot of flavor, something that makes a difference. Nasturtiums and roses and lavender and bee balm. Not only does it sound interesting, but it tastes really good too. It's it's delicious. Superb. Later in the show, we're going to make a rose-flavored radish soup and sautéed trout with a nasturtium and gooseberry sauce. This recipe is sure to make your taste buds blossom. So in my household, we would call this a table pounder. That's where you go. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Tomas is in Quincy to visit a family farm who is growing and using lavender in more ways than one. Hey everybody, how's it going? Good morning. I'm Tomas. Tomas, nice to meet you. I'm Julie. Nice to meet you. Hi, it's Tomas, Dave. Julie, her husband Dave, and two of their kids, Chelsea and Matt, started farming lavender a few years ago. They also grow apples, cherries, and pears, but their lavender has turned into more than just a labor of love. What I'm hearing about your company that's so unique is you're all playing a big role in it, right? Oh, it's a family operation. <laughs> now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Depends on the day. <laughs> Trinity Gardens has two and a half acres of different lavender varieties, and Matt serves as the propagator, growing additional stock from cuttings of those crops. We want to find where you can see, we call it woody growth, where it starts to get- This stuff? Yep, that yeah. gray color. And we find close to there, and you want something close to the leaf right here, because that's going to be the most um, vigorous. That's where it wants to grow. That's where the root's going to want to sprout. Yes. Okay. So we'll just come in and take a cutting. Matt then puts each cutting into a growing medium, and after careful attention, the cutting will turn into a new lavender plant ready for customers. How many different varieties of lavender is there? Huh. Uh, too many to count. Matt's sister Chelsea then showed us how to hand harvest the plants for distilling. So this feels good right about in there. And then just give it a good little cut. Uh -huh. 
And there there's my first bunch of lavender. Well Check done. That out. <laughs> and make sure when you're picking them up too, the bees will still be in there. <laughs> After loading the piles up, we head to the distilling unit where the lavender is steamed to extract its oil. So is this kind of like a press? Is no, the lavender going in there or in there? In here. Okay, so it's a steam there. distillation. Oh, so okay. You can see the level where the pot sits. Right. So eventually this water will start boiling. The steam will come up through the lavender and it will collect the oil out of the lavender and it'll come through this into our condenser here and it'll cool it down to turn it back into a liquid. Once we loaded the pot, it was ready to be boiled and go through the steaming process. They let their oil sit for about a year before bottling it up. They've learned that's the perfect amount of time to produce the smooth scent that their customers prefer. This is the hanging room, right? Yes, this is our dry shed. Now, is the dried stuff what will be used for culinary types of lavender? Um, that's a fantastic question, actually. Uh, we have different kinds of varieties, uh, as you've seen in the field and they can all be consumed. They're, oh, okay. Yep, every variety can be. However, each uh, lavender carries a different flavor or scent profile. Uh, so there are certain varieties that are deeper uh, colored purples. They're usually uh, an angustifolia and they have the best flavor profiles. And ooh, a little, a little travel pack yeah. right here for me. That's our pillow spray and our lip balm, two of our nice. favorite things, that's for you. Thank you so much, You're Chelsea. so welcome. Appreciate it. Yeah. Have you ever bought flowers at the grocery store, at the nursery for your backyard? How about a boutonniere or corsage at the garden center? Those flowers are healthy, disease-free, and pest-free because of Washington State Department of Agriculture's Nursery Inspection Program. Today I met with Cindy Cooper from WSDA at the Seymour Botanical Conservatory. Cindy and her team of plant protectors do surprise inspections for over 5,000 licensed retail and wholesale nurseries in Washington State. We're looking for uh, symptoms of plant disease, um, viruses that infect fruit trees. Um, we're looking for, you know, snails and slugs. That's a very common thing to find, of course, sure. in our wet side Washington. Um, so you can only have a very low, limited amount of that stuff on plant material for sale. No one wants to have invasive or destructive pests in the plants they buy for their gardens. These very detailed inspections aim to help businesses and protect consumers. Folks are very helpful and knowledgeable about their plant material, but we can help be an extra set of eyes for them. Hopefully it's a good educational process for the the nursery uh, employee that we're talking to. Cindy and WSDA also enforce the licensing requirements for businesses. Anyone who sells over $100 worth of plant material a year is required to have a nursery license. This ensures consumers that when they go to a nursery, they won't take plants that carry any pest or diseases home to their gardens, and by extension, won't affect the native natural environment of Washington. WSDA even has a prohibited plant list to make sure that invasive and harmful species aren't sold in Washington State. We're tasked with both uh, consumer protection, um, environmental protection, and also um, facilitating trade of plant material between the states. We have a, a huge wine grape industry in this state. We have a strong grapevine quarantine that makes sure that anything coming here is, is safe for our wine industry. Um, the same with fruit trees and uh, blueberry plants. There are you know, lots of consumer protections going on that folks aren't even aware of. These behind the scene protections affect consumers, producers, ag industries, and keep our state beautiful. So the next time you stop and smell the roses, thank WSDA for them being healthy and pest free. Here's a great question about lavender everyone always asks us. Is there only one kind of variety for culinary use? Stay tuned and I will give you the answer. Coming up, I'll be cooking with edible flowers in the Marmite kitchen. It's a party in my mouth. And we'll be in the second Harvest Kitchen trying out a viewer's shortbread cookie recipe that uses some lovely lavender. What kinds of lavender can be used for culinary use? We tell everyone all varieties. Lavender is an edible flower and they vary in scent and flavor profile, so just choose the one that you'd like. We're back to Seattle at the restaurant Marmite, where they're serving up unique and floral ingredients with their French cuisine. It's really delicious, it's local, and it's fresh. Very intimate, 
quaint, but also very sophisticated. I lived in Paris for three years, and so this delicious. takes me right back. Owner and chef Bruce Naftali believes that sauces and broths are the heart and soul of the restaurant. We have a giant vintage 40-gallon steam kettle to make stock in, a giant marmite, wow. sort of the heart of the yeah. restaurant. We make the stocks in there that become the soups and sauces, the flavors the restaurant's famous for. Chef Naftali is inspired to use flowers in his cooking and experiments with their different flavors and appearances. You know, things like bachelor buttons and violas and even calendulas, pansies, they look gorgeous, but they don't really add anything to the dish besides appearance. Nasturtiums and roses and lavender and bee balm, I mean, those are they have very assertive flavors. Today, we're highlighting edible flowers in two dishes, a rose-flavored radish soup and a sauteed trout with nasturtium and gooseberries. We begin our rose and radish soup by chopping onions, shallots, and leeks and putting them in a pot. So these are just gonna cook over low heat until they are relaxed and translucent. Then we cut radishes into quarters. Once the vegetables become translucent, we add the radishes to the pot and prepare our rose petals. Mm, that yeah. so good. If you simmer them in honey, Ooh. and then strain them out, uh -huh. you can get rose petal infused honey. I make a real dynamite pork sauce, mm -hmm. and that's really good when it's sweetened with, uh, Some sweetened with rose infused oh. honey. Yum. Next, we put our rose petals in the pot and add chicken stock. Then we're going to raise the heat to bring it to a boil. Then we're going to turn it down and simmer it until the, rose, the radishes are tender. About 10 to 15 minutes later, Chef Naftali purees the soup, adds salt, and whisks it together. Finally, we add rose petals to the top and taste it. Yeah, that's good. That is good. It's not an overpowering rosiness at all. It's it just there is a good blend of flavors. Yes. And it tastes like a cream soup, mm -hmm. but there's no cream in it. Then we start to make our trout dish using nasturtium and gooseberries. Now that is a sweet, peppery, assertive flavor. Oh, that's delicious. It's yummy. Mm -hmm. Though I found that if you take nasturtium seeds and pickle them, they then you, have you get like a, a giant, beautiful caper. Nice. And if you're brave, you can eat that. So I'll eat I don't one. know if I'm brave. <laughs> It's spicy. spicy. Woohoo! And now it's time for the gooseberries. A gooseberry is this wonderful, strange looking, strange looking little, little, you look like little watermelons kind of. We're going to cook the gooseberries and nasturtiums in butter. After they cook down, Chef Naftali strains the mix through a food mill. Oh, there we go. Oh, look at that color that's coming through now. <laughs> Whoa. Next, in a separate pot, we reduce fish stock and cream down to a sauce, then add the gooseberry and nasturtium puree. And the last thing you do is salt to taste. Mm. That's there. That's really good. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, we pour our yummy sauce over sautéed trout and garnish the dish with nasturtiums, gooseberries, and bee balm. And have you served? something like this here at Marmite? Oh, Meats? absolutely. Yeah? So what do people say when they, they get a dish like this? They come in and they, they leave believers. Awesome. <laughs> Look at how beautiful that is. Does anyone ever say it looks too pretty to eat? Yes. Yeah. But you're like, just <laughs> try just, it. Look, Trust eat me. it. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's a party in my mouth. Cool. Yes. Mm. And it's just a little bit of sweetness in mm -hmm. the gooseberry too. Mm -hmm. So in my household, we would call this a table pounder. It's where you go. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to get both of these recipes from Marmite, visit our website at wagrown.com. You can give someone flowers for any occasion. And living here in Washington, we have a wide array of beautiful buds to choose from. Us Washingtonians have probably seen and smelled lilacs, lavender, tulips, and our state flower, the coast rhododendron. But flowers aren't just for their beauty and smell. Some Washington flowers are edible and can be used in your cooking and baking. It's important to point out that there are flowers that are not edible, so make sure the flowers that you choose to use in the kitchen are safe to eat. Some safe flower favorites are violas and pansies, which are used for their garnishing dishes because of their beauty. Some flowers are used for their flavors as well. 
Nasturtium are a chef go-to because they have a bold and peppery taste. The flowers, buds, and leaves can be made into an omelet, mixed into a sauce, or added to a salad. Lavender can be baked into cookies, cake, and even used in ice cream. Rose petals can be made into sorbets, butters, jams, and my favorite, rose petal infused honey. Mmm. Now that's what I call the ultimate edible arrangement. Coming up, I'm visiting the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market. A lot of flowers in here people don't realize are edible. Yeah. Hey, let's go! Next door to Marmeet is the Bake Shop Amandine, where Bruce's wife Sarah is also using flowers to make her sweet creations. My husband and I have always grown and used a lot of edible flowers, even when it wasn't necessarily super trendy. <laughs> um, and we have a small garden that's crammed full of edible flowers, bachelor buttons, nasturtiums. We have a ton of different roses. Um, all fairly scenty and smelly, and they we use them in a myriad of different ways. Well, I think we're going to try one of your macarons, correct? I think you are. Is it a, a chocolate one? Chocolate lavender. All right, chocolate lavender. I can't wait to try it. Sounds well, awesome. I hope you like it. How often would you say you use flowers in your cooking? Oh, never. Never? Never. Why is that? Because I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've used too many flowers. Why is that? I just don't know what to use. Well, I've eaten them, but I haven't cooked with them myself. Our friends here at Amadine have got this great chocolate macaron with a little bit of a flour in there. I'm going to have you taste it, see if you can guess what it is for okay. me. Okay, go ahead. Is that lavender? There you go. Oh, okay. It, the lavender's subtle. It's not like there's a little chunk of it in the middle. So <laughs> right. It's good. It's, it's all infused in there. It's good. It's like I'm like hanging out out in the field, like about to have a picnic. It's really floral, light, smells like lavender taste. It's very like springy. It's great. Good, so the lavender's not too much. No, not at all. Just perfect. Yeah. Okay, so there's your assignment. Go home and try to learn <laughs> okay. something to cook yeah. with lavender. <laughs> Will do. Today we got the inside scoop where to get some of the best flowers in Seattle. I met with Molly Sadowski, the general manager of the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market. We are a co-op of 14 flower farmers and plant growers, actually. We've got farms mostly in Washington and some farms in Oregon. Um, and so those farms actually own this business. This is um, Dennis and Diane's farm. Uh -huh. um, they were one of the founders of this co-op. They were having a really hard time as a small farm getting their product to their customer base. Yeah. They would have to run a bucket truck, which pulled them off the farm. Yeah. And they could maybe max hit like 10 to 15 customers in a day. Because of the co-op, the growers can sell to many different businesses. We have retail florists that have shops. Mm -hmm. We have event florists that don't have a retail space, but they do events only. Um, and then we also sell to like handful of like restaurants, uh, interior designers, photographers doing photo shoots, yeah. um, grocery stores, and so those are our okay. main customers. Each of the growers brings unique items to the market. Those are gigantic marigolds. They're huge. <laughs> They're huge. <laughs> There's even one grower that has edible flowers. They have been doing nasturtium and bachelor button and um, sweet pea flower, pansies, violas, yeah. like really beautifully displayed. And a lot of flowers in here people don't realize are edible. Yeah. I got the chance to talk with Carly, a grower from Karen Farm, and learned about her experience. What does it mean to be part of a co-op? as a grower. So we own this company, so we buy in a portion of it. So it kind of um, makes you have a little bit more ownership. You want to get to know your customers, you want to get to know the other growers because they're your business partners. What's nice about this co-op is there are opportunities for young farm farmers yeah. to get trained and to get that kind of mentorship. If we have questions, like I'm a younger grower, so I rely on the older growers to help me out and you know I might help an older grower harvest or weed if they need some help. The community of growers also helps out with the market on busy days. So most people are buying on Wednesday mm -hmm. for Saturday events. Sure. And so Wednesday you will see like the most growers here, the most product here. The Seattle Wholesale Growers Market is open year round and the majority of flowers are freshly grown in Washington State. How do these flowers differ from say, I'm gonna order a bouquet online or something like that? Well, most of those flowers are 
are imported, but locally grown flowers will just last a little longer. So if you can find a florist that uses fresh cut flowers from a local grower, the arrangement will typically last longer depending on the flower. It's nice to also get to know your flower growers so that you know if you are cooking or something with, with local flowers, you're yeah. not ingesting pesticides, which you wouldn't necessarily know from an imported flower grower. We're known for, I think, the variety that we carry, um, the quality of our product, and, um, and that it's locally grown. If you wanted to shop here as a wholesale customer, we set you up. It, we require a Washington State business license in order to shop here. But don't worry, although the market is mostly for wholesale buyers, they also give access to the public. The public is able to shop with us just on Fridays from 10 a.m. to noon, so it's a pretty narrow window. Mm -hmm. We have a website, it's seattlewholesalegrowersmarket.com. Okay. There are hours there for the public and also a map there for people to find us. That's a great opportunity, though, to come and see locally grown flowers. Absolutely, and a lot of probably flowers that people have never seen before. I'm here with Tomas at the kitchen at Second Harvest, and we're joined by Laurent Cerati uh, from Fleur de Sel Restaurant and Crepery. And we get to taste some of the some of the recipes that uh, viewers have sent in. And so we are do talking about lavender. So oh, cooking with flowers, flowers. right? Oh, yes. So at your restaurant, do I, you use flowers we, a lot? We do. Uh, Mainly we garnish with flower, pansies, orchids. Uh, yeah. You know, they're, they're pretty yeah. in a salad as a garnish for a dish. It's pretty, but lavender talks to me because uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, the south of France. Right. It's, Provence, it's Provence. Exactly. It's something that is uh, special in, in flavor. Uh, if you put too much lavender in a dish, well, it tastes like soap. Right. You know, <laughs> you know one of my favorite creme brulee I, I make is a lavender scented creme brulee, Ooh, you know, yeah. with a touch so of yeah, lavender and a touch of vanilla. That it's beautiful. Amazing. So, yeah. so flowers are, you know, you can infuse lavender. I've been able to cook with um, like nasturtiums and rose petals oh, those are those, um, yeah. and some other different things that we made soups out of and sauces. And it was just unbelievable, blew my mind. Yeah. Yeah. that that's what it ended up tasting like, because you think, oh, I'm going to eat some flowers. Flowers. <laughs> and right. it can be very scary at first when yes. you're thinking of flowers, because you don't usually oh. think of throwing rose petals and yeah. things like yeah. that. Beautiful. So we are um, going to have some lavender shortbread cookies. Oh, I love shortbread. Right? So this, this is... is from Mary Eileen. And uh, so a buttery lavender flavored dough. And she uses finely chopped fresh lavender in these oh, cookies. Beautiful, so, I know, beautiful, I cannot taste wait. so delicate. So we're gonna see how they're made first.
these look beautiful. Oh, they are beautiful. Yeah. They look good. They we do need a well. cup of tea, don't we? Oh, we do. It would be great. Little Hold your pinky tea. out. I, 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 I love a cup of tea. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about freaky. Mmm. Mm -hmm. mm. That's a short bread. That lavender, it's it's there, but it's not overpowering. No. It's very nice. It's just kind of like a little hello. And I, li I like oh, I like the yeah. I like it. I could eat it. You have to you do have to be careful with the lavender though. Like you said, if you yeah. use too much, yeah. then it tastes like you're eating soap. Yeah. Something. But this is but perfect. No, this perfect is great. balance. These are great. And, the, and the the cookie dough is fantastic. Mm. I like it a lot. Very good. So we're gonna say Mary Eileen. Yeah, Mary Eileen. Awesome. To get Mary Eileen's recipe for lavender shortbread cookies, visit wagrown.com. Sometimes it's just good to stop and smell the flowers, whether they are fresh from the farm, the market, or the kitchen. That's it for this episode of Washington Grown. Thanks for watching.